Today, I don't believe that there was such a thing. I think it was a dream. But with all that, I still see it all today. Every detail, as if it had happened today. Today I'm sitting here and talking, and I don't believe even today that this happened to me, that I'm still able to sit here and talk about this subject, despite the fact that the nightmares pursue me not for a day or two, not for a year or two. There are days when I keep looking back to see if there isn't a guard or an SS man. But despite this, I play the game of the normal person. I don't know if I am normal. I think that anyone who came out of a camp can't possibly be normal. The things that happened to me took place 30 or 31 years ago. It isn't easy to go back to that period. I'm doing this out of a sense of duty and because of a vow that I'm honouring to that period and for those who cannot recount it and surely wanted the world to know what happened. In this film, individual witnesses trace their experience of Nazi racism. Auschwitz is history. Race prejudice still persists. In 1918, men who had gone to the front, kindled with national pride, returned to a defeated, embittered Germany. These had survived. Homecoming was cause for celebration. Yet their heroism had been wasted. Their victories squandered. Someone must be to blame. The Kaiser and the old aristocratic order? Or the communists and the threat of a new order newly come to power in Russia? Or perhaps the Jews? Fear of them was as old as Christianity itself. Kaiser had been defeated. Germany became, for the first time, a parliamentary democracy. But the early years of the Weimar Republic were violent. Communists worked to spread world revolution from Russia to Germany. Loyalists acted to impose order by force. Separatists were for breaking up the fragile, unified German state. For millions of Germans who wanted only order and stability, the years after the First World War were a time of national humiliation, economic misery, threats of violence, fears of communism. There was ruinous inflation. People lost confidence in their money, in their rulers, in themselves. Nothing is anchored any longer, Adolf Hitler told his first audiences in Munich. Hitler was attuned to German anxieties. An Austrian who had fought with distinction in the German army, he promised to replace chaos with unifying racial struggle. Hitler called for the realization of an old nationalist dream, the union of all Germans in a great German state, one Reich embracing all the German-speaking peoples. Not only Austrians and East Prussians, but Germans in the Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, Germans in Poland, in Yugoslavia, Germans even in Russia. Some German politicians feared, or said they feared, that the nation would be swamped by Slavs to the east. 
the Nazi party demanded new territory there, where a growing German population could settle. And the Nazi program called for the expulsion from Germany of strangers, of immigrants. Paragraph 4. Only those who are our fellow countrymen can become citizens. Only those who have German blood, regardless of creed, can be our countrymen. Hence, no Jew can be a countryman. A visible enemy is what is needed, said Hitler. In Nazi publications, the Jew was projected as the villain responsible for all Germany's troubles. If he hadn't existed, we would have had to invent him. Only one German in a hundred was Jewish, 600,000 in all. But the Nazis could build on centuries of Christian prejudice. Shylock, Fagin were familiar figures. Hitler would use the Jew as the single opponent on whom everyone could focus his fear and discontent. Jews are not wanted here. The party ideologist, Alfred Rosenberg, claimed that an international conspiracy of Jews, communists and capitalists, called the Elders of Zion, was bent on ruining the white races, especially the Germans. Most people dismissed such fantasies as examples of Nazi bad taste. Jews in Eastern Europe were long used to being different, to discrimination, persecution, pogrom. They wore their own dress and spoke their own language. Yiddish. In the West, in Holland or Czechoslovakia, where these films were taken later to be incorporated in Nazi propaganda, it was easier to assimilate, though perhaps not always possible to enter the local golf club. For centuries, Jews had been of a different religion. Now, pseudoscience marked them as a separate race. Nazi ideology perverted Darwin's theory of natural selection to claim that Northern European Aryan man was superior, but locked in a biological struggle for survival against lesser races, Asiatics, blacks, gypsies, and Jews, the anti-race, bacteria decomposing the bodies of the host nations in which they lived. The person to be admired in the Nazi propaganda mirror was the German peasant. Peasant art, folk art, was uncorrupted. The last pure survival of racial tribal culture before pollution by the Industrial Revolution. Simple traditions reassured people who felt lost in anonymous cities or confused by more modern customs. To the public, Hitler said, a reasonable anti-Semitism must lead to the expulsion of the Jews. And Jew hatred united the factions of the National Socialist Party. The SA, the party stormtroopers, uniformed street bullies. And the party's internal police, the SS. In 1929, Hitler appointed an unassuming worker in the Munich party office an ex-laboratory assistant in a fertilizer firm, as Reichsführer SS, Heinrich Himmler. When Himmler took over, the SS were a 300-man subsection of the stormtroopers whose job was to protect Hitler at public meetings. Himmler was to develop them into a party elite, responsible for the purity, morals, and discipline of the entire movement. They would take over from the SA as the most powerful force in the party. Throughout the 1920s, the Nazis remained a minor party in German politics. Their ideas were not taken seriously. But 
But in 1929, the world's economies crashed. For Germany, after years of ruinous inflation, it was a new disaster. Six million were out of work. More than 20 million lived off the dole. People became ready to think that perhaps Herr Hitler was right. Germany must be the victim of plots, of an international conspiracy. The Nazis claimed to offer a new approach, a new hope of salvation. Now millions were ready to respond to Hitler's emotional appeal. A resurgence of German greatness based on ethnic pride, loyalty to their race. For people living in misery, it was inspiring to be told that they were the master race, and that Jews, gypsies, Slavs, black men were subspecies. It appealed to the need to think better of yourself by thinking worse of someone else. Perhaps democracy had failed. Perhaps it was only a matter of time before an authoritarian government, Nazi or communist, took over. The respectable people who queued to recover their savings from collapsing banks would always be frightened of revolutionary communists. The middle classes, ruined by forces over which they had no control, responded to Nazi promises and ordered society national unity, an end to the class struggle. No more chaos, order. Karl Wolf came from a distinguished military family. He lost his job as an officer when the Allies forced Germany to reduce the size of her army. In 1929, he was 29. Then, at the end of the 20s, a former regimental and company comrade from my lifeguard regiment, a Captain Julius von Bernhut, came to Munich and explained a great deal to me about conditions under communism and so on. And made it clear to me that everything would lead to a great decision either for the far right, say National Socialism, or the far left, Communism. And he appealed to me, you volunteered very early for the war, didn't you? So now, when there's a question of a political decision which will affect your future and that of your family and your children, then you too, you too must join the party even though you actually don't want to have anything to do with politics or don't care for it. And that's how it happened. So that in 1931, I came to join the party. At that time, I only knew about the SA. I had absolutely no idea of the existence of an SS. In the Empfangshalle, dieses alten, adlichen Palais. In the reception hall, there was a large desk set up. Behind it were sitting people in party uniforms, which weren't yet familiar to me. And they asked me what 